So Dr. Louis Saraki's career in diplomacy, media, and African women studies spans over 15 years with vast knowledge and experience, both locally in Kenya and internationally. She's one of Africa's leading women's champions, a sought after guest lecturer, and a successful media professional as a radio host, TV talk show host, and writer with keen focus on African women's issues. Dr. Mubi is best known for her popular current online syndicated talk show, yeah. The Dr. Mubi Show. Yeah. <laughs> which is one of Kenya's most highly rated online programs with a huge following across sub-Saharan Africa and among Africans living within the diaspora. Our next panelist is Professor Fumi Lola Fagbamila. So. Lola is a Nigerian-American scholar, activist, playwright, and artist. While her artistry is multifaceted, including spoken word and hip-hop, her current project entitled The Intersection is a stage play on the complexities of black identity and what she has coined the black liberation ego. Having recently completed her graduate program at UCLA in Black Studies, Fumi, Fumi Lola now serves as a professor of Pan-African Studies at Cal State Long, Los Angeles. As an original member of the Black Lives Matter movement, she has been organizing with Black Lives Matter since its inception in 2013. In 2015, Professor Fumi was honored by the United States Congress and the Black Community Clergy and Labor Alliance for her commendable activist scholarship, service, and struggle. She frequently sits on community panels regarding police brutality, criminal justice, and overall wellness in black communities. Most recently, presenting at a conference held by UCLA School of Law. So if we can give it one more time for Professor Fumi. The next panel suite that we have is Brother Reza Islam. Reza Islam was born March 17, 1990, in the Richland Farms area of Compton, California. Growing up in the city of Compton, he was constantly forced to confront the daily plight of inner city youth trying to make it with, the, with meager resources. Gang violence, drugs, and peer pressure were an everyday occurrence where he grew up. As a child, he went to Winnie Mandela's Children's Learning Village, where he learned traditional African morals and principles, along with basic school subjects. Reza Islam attended Compton College, majoring in political science, also studying briefly at Hubbard College of Administration. At the age of nine, after witnessing the condition of the people in the community, Reza decided that he wanted to do something about it. He was asked one day to help a young student with their homework, and he agreed. After helping this student with their work, he felt empowered to seeing this help. This help was effective, and from that day, his purpose has been to save humanity and change the world. So our next panelist is Dr. John Paul Higgins. With an impressive list of credentials, Dr. Jonathan P. Higgins is multi-hyphenate thought leader in the true sense of the word, media critic, writer, scholar, and social justice defender that continues to demonstrate an uncanny ability to thrive while speaking truth to power. As a Lambda Literary Maynard and Pointner Writing Fellow, their work has been included on sites like SYFY, Huffington Post, The Root, The Daily Dot, Blavity, and Shadow and Act on Being and More. With over a total following of 10,000 followers on all social media spaces, they have been highlighted on the site like ATTN, Vox, BuzzFeed, and New Now Next. You can follow them by using the social media handle at Dr. John Paul. So one more time for Dr. John. Uh, 
last but certainly not least, we have Zaza Ali. Zaza is a mother, teacher, activist, radio personality, and self-published author. Her first book entitled Black Matters, Volume 1, The Scientific Intervention of Our Affairs was released May of 2015. Volume 2, Plagues of Dysfunction was released December 2016. And her third and final edition of the trilogy, Black Matters, entailed Lifting the Veil on Racism and White Supremacy is set to be released early 2019. A frequent speaker on behalf of women and children, Zaza has done extensive research on cultural norms impacting the black community, as well as a global dichotomy of racism and its impact on the human, on the human family. Her popular and growing presence on social media, fueled by somewhat controversial perspectives, has her popularity growing, <clears throat> has aided in her work to implement programs for private-owned schools as well as provide financial assistance for small business owners. The message to the audience of every demographic remains the same. Self-accountability and an emphasis on truth, spiritual development, and service to others is the key to revolution. before, um, if now is not the time, if it wasn't before that we needed to unify, it's now, I personally it's now or never. I feel like what's going on in the world today and all that's going on in politics and we're seeing things unravel that was probably in place years before we even knew what's going to happen. And so now is really the time where we can't have division amongst our community. Um, we can't have unnecessary division. We need to come together as, as much as we can. And a lot of what we were seeing on campus within different students coming from different areas um, and different backgrounds was a lot of divide and tension, uh, ultimately, between students that were, that, you know, were black Americans or African Americans and students that were from the continent or students that were um, born here but had parents from different countries. And so um, we kind of just started thinking, like, where does that come from? And why is it that, you know, when people come here, being black, why is being black called, is, is such a disgrace to some people? Or why, why don't people understand that when you're here in America, like, we're seen as, as just black? And so to kind of open up our panel discussion to the panelists, we just wanted to start off really with um, just an opener and, and, and answering um, you all, for you all to recall your experiences having grown up being black or African, born in Africa, America, and or first generation, so if you um, identify as one of those. And then how has your upbringing impacted your worldview on black and African people's condition? So whoever would like to go first. I'll go first. <laughs> Um, peace and love, everybody. How y'all doing? It is an honor for me to be here with all of you. Um, I pray within, as well as to all of you, that something that I say and that we say uh, affects your individual and collective consciousness. Thank you so much to Sister Tiki, Kiki, and all of the staff uh, at the, of the Black Student Union um, for putting this together and for your intention, which is the most powerful empowering and powerful thing in the universe. Intention is everything um, as we rise. Um, for me, I am a native of Oakland, California. Uh, one of the best things my father could have ever done was put me in a privately uh, owned African Center school called Hope Academy, which was the inception of my love for my people as well as you know my consciousness. Um, so that's what started it all. Every morning we sung the Black National Anthem, so I know it line by line, all three verses. Um, but just for me to see our people in positions of leadership in that school, um, from the janitor to the principal to everyone in the faculty was very important for me because 
it created a lack of a ceiling in my mind as far as what I could do and what I could become. Also, you know, Oakland is definitely one of the most revolutionary stu uh, cities in the world. So between the Black Panthers and the impact of the Nation of Islam there and all of the political and liberal um, you know, perspectives that came from that area had a very strong impact on me. And then when crack hit in the late 80s, I saw Oakland go from a beacon of light where we were in powerful positions in you know, politics and uh, had a strong economy to being an open grave site for our people, uh, impacting a very large portion of my family, my aunties, my uncles, my sister. Um, it affected me tremendously because I saw what we could be and what we had the power to be and what the worst of what we could be if we were not in control of our mental and spiritual faculties. So that's what inspired the scientific intervention in our affairs because from my research and my observation and my perspective, I felt that crack cocaine was an intentional and biologically created weapon of mass destruction that was meant to destroy our people, whether directly through uh, use of the drug or indirectly through the prison industrial complex. So all of those things, uh, along with studying the teachings of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and uh, all of the great thought leaders that came before me is what inspired to do and become who I am today. Everybody, I'm Dr. John Higgins. Um, I will first say that I'm extremely thankful to be called back here. Uh, for many of you who may be in the room who know me, I did work here for a short time. Um, and now that I am my own entrepreneur and doing kind of my own thing, um, it has been a blessing to kind of see the students bring me back and see what I'm doing and actually show love towards that and want to continue to support the work that I do. Um, I think it's important for me to first note, and I will always do this in every space because I recognize that a part of who I am and a part of my journey is me telling my, speaking my truth and speaking uh, truth to power in relation to who I am. Being black and being queer is a big part of how I look at myself as a black person. Um, and a lot of that is influenced in this idea of me having to relearn what I knew about myself and what I believe to be true about myself. A lot of my blackness, and I say very intentionally, blackness as a, as a piece for me, um, was taught to me in a way to be ashamed of who I am, uh, ashamed of how I thought about myself and how I saw myself in the world. And so oftentimes I'll come into spaces and I, I, I contest and I struggle with myself, even as a doctor, do I speak truth to that identity or do I hide it? Um, and even in this space today, I'm, I, I recognize how people see me, I recognize how people react to me and how I show up, but I recognize uh, from the learnings of Audre Lorde and the learnings of you know um, Bayard Rustin, et cetera, et cetera, them writing and them speaking so much to their blackness in a way that was unapologetic is who I am and who I have to be. So growing up, um, I grew up in San Bernardino. I was born in Compton. Uh, shout out to 127th and Pearl. That's where I grew up. <laughs> that was home. Um, at the Church of Chicken is where me and my brother used to play. Um, and so growing up in, in Compton and seeing my mom and, and my father split, um, my mother, when she moved us to the Inland Empire, was very intentional about telling us education meant everything for us. Uh, my mom was, my mom would always say, you're no stupid dummy. That was her favorite thing to say. And so that was a reminder for me that education was important. But I recognized that my mom didn't talk to me about blackness because I don't think that she even understood her blackness. And I think that it was intentional that my father, my grandfather and her and his father and his mother did that intentionally because they wanted them to be separate from what the struggles and what the problems were happening in Los Angeles. And so when I would go be with my father, who was a part of the Nation of Islam, and then when I would go between my mother, there was a struggle there. And in both of those spaces, I learned to hate myself because of a lot of the things I was being taught. No shame, but it was just real. Um, and so now I'm at a part in my life where in terms of being black or African-American or however I identify, 
I recognize that there's a lot of the learning I've had to do. I've had to recognize and have real conversations with myself through my writing, uh, through the conversations I've had with students, through the interactions I've had with media spaces, that a big part of my life is coming to terms with the things that I struggled with or the things that I didn't feel comfortable with speaking openly about, and recognizing that when I started to speak my truth, I was moving a legion of people behind me to do the same. And so I think a lot about that in terms of my African, you know, my Africanness or my blackness. It's this idea of me having to reclaim it, me having to relearn it, and me having to find peace within it. So I'm grateful to be here. I'm glad to be with this conference. I was here last year. Thank you to the BSU for bringing me back. We had a great productive conversation last year. And um, I want us to build from where we left off. I will say a quick kind of edit to my bio as, um, thank you for introducing us. Um, that was not my most recent bio, but I just want to give a little bit of context. Yes, I am a professor of Pan-African Studies. Yes, I did help to create um, Black Lives Matter in terms of its original iteration five years ago. And I am a playwright. And um, my most recent play came out earlier this year at the Pan-African Film Festival after some reviews from sisters like Erica Badu and some of our most prominent freedom fighters like Angela Davis. And the reason why it was able to circulate in the way that it was was because it's having a conversation that we're about to have on this panel right now about what it means for black people to be able to function healthfully, collectively, logically, um, and to be able to move toward not only a domestic black nationalism, but an international global pan-Africanism. And being able to look at those projects critically and practically and say, how do we do that, right? And so I wanted to just give a little bit of that context before I talk about myself personally in terms of my experience. So when I think about this question that you've asked us, what my experience was as a first generation Nigerian American, my parents were born and raised in Nigeria. Uh, my dad came to America maybe about 30 something years ago. And I was raised, and my mom came a few years after him. I was raised in a Nigerian household, um, in an African household. And so I was brought up culturally Nigerian, but of course, I don't have a Nigerian accent. So I walk through the world and I walk through this country being received of, before you know my name, the assumption is that, you know, I, I just, I'd be a black American, right? And so we have all kinds of different identities from Jamaicans, those of us from the Caribbean, West Africa, what have you. But the assumption is that I'm a black American until somebody sees my name. And I use the term black American loosely. You understand that I mean African within America. You with me, right? You got me. I'm just, I'm just, I'm with, I'm, I'm with it. I'm just, you know, you're using terms for the sake of discussion. So bear with me. African in America, right? Okay, so this assumption about my identity immediately. And so what that did was it allowed for me to be in conversation with my African family about what I was observing this black community in America experiencing. And I was able to be in conversation with Africans in, in America, or what would be the people perceived of as black Americans, about the way in which Africans were functioning and considering them and thinking about them. And this kind of divide that exists within the community. And I know that we're gonna get into it, into our conversation about why this divide exists, but I will say, one of my kind of primary thoughts about my identity is that I sit at the intersection in the middle of these two communities, which allows for me to understand both. And it allows for me to be a translator between communities so that we can actually move toward a global black collectivity um, and to move toward being able to really be in communication with each other and to be able to disagree respectfully. That's something we have not really even scratched the surface towards. Y'all feel me when I say that, right? Is to be able to disagree respectfully. And I think that part of why this conference is this is for us to be able to do that and to not only disagree respectfully, but to come to terms about the things that we need to agree on, right? To be able to move forward in a functional way. So that's coming some of the first things that come to mind. <laughs> Hi everyone, how are you doing? Hi. 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 Greetings from 
from Kenya, greetings from Africa. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Kiki, and oh, you guys are so awesome. Thank you for flying me in here. Before I even get started about growing up in Africa, um, a lot of Africans who watch my show insisted that I start my message by telling you you are loved Aww. by people on the continent, and they just said that. send their love, they send their greetings, they send their best wishes, and um, it's just important to realize that for Africa, we've kind of been under a hole and behind a rock. We haven't really been knowing what our family across the world has been going through, not just in the United States, but also in Europe, in the Caribbean, um, because we've been shut off, and there's been a veil, but that veil is lifting, and so we're all like, <gasps> Um, but yeah, so just know that you are loved by Africans and they really want all of you to even come and visit wherever, whatever country you go to, you are most welcome. Um, for me, growing up in Africa was just, growing up in Kenya was awesome. Um, uh, it was awesome being around, I mean it was all I knew, being around um, all black people from the president to, you know, to the teachers, to the family, it was, it was an amazing experience, but there was a lot of emphasis on getting an education. And the reason there was a lot of emphasis is because we never gained independence. Independence was a lie, but it was something that our grandparents put up with. So we got our physical independence where we got our land back, but we had to fight for our mental and spiritual independence, which we're still fighting for till this day. And so um, our grandparents never really told us, and even in schools, we never really learned of what colonialism was like. You kind of learned it once you got to university and started awakening if you had the opportunity to travel. So um, we never really got that perspective of what our grandparents had endured to get our land back and how we were still in a neo-colonial order. Um, because they replaced themselves with African puppets and also just the wizardry and the sorcery that was used to get Africa and to maintain Africa where it is right now. It's something that we are totally naive to. Um, and it's only, you know, when you, when you leave Africa that you realize, wow, you know, we're still in bondage. So the emphasis has always been on us um, getting an education. That was that was the most important thing, you know. From your your mom, your mom and your dad always emphasized the importance of getting an education, hoping that we would awaken um, at this time, and also getting an education in the Western system. So understanding who our enemy was, because they are an enemy, um, and we can't we can't deceive ourselves about that. Understanding how they see us and understanding that we are totally in their system. We, from the way we identify ourselves to the way we, you know, to this language that we're communicating in today. So the funny thing about, um, the funny thing about growing up in Kenya, I'll keep it short, <laughs> is we all had Western names. So we all had, you know, my name used to be Yvonne. <laughs> and, you know, Mumbi was my second name. And so, um, you know, we all loved our Western names, which just showed you how indoctrinated we were. But one thing we're seeing now is a lot of us are starting to return back to our, to our real names, and that's our real identity. So it's... Um, it's, it's complicated because you, you almost grow up in a lie, but you're on your land, you're, you're seeing your people in charge and everything, but you realize that there's a hidden hand that has always been on you. And as we, you know, and you realize that all the people who ever spoke out were either silenced, compromised, or bought out. And so there is a burden on our generation to totally flip the script and get everything back, get our identity back, get our minds back, get our souls back. And, um, and that's, that's what we've grown up with in Africa, knowing that this battle was coming, you know, educating ourselves and, and, and just preparing for the time that is upon us. Yeah. These family brotheries Islam, uh, the language that I'm going to use is Arabic and that greeting is assalamu alaikum. We have many different greetings as a people. So for some of us we will say peace, we'll say assalamu alaikum, we will say black power. 
Black power. Black power. Black power. Not afraid, right? It's the BSU, right? Okay, I'm good. We can clap. I mean, you heard some of the some of the most beautiful introductions and speakers here, and I'm honored to be on this panel. Uh, when I saw the names, I said, "Okay, it's that time." And, uh, and once again, I'm just honored to serve here. Uh, just being a young brother in the community, my name is Brother Riza Islam. I was born with that name, thankfully, uh, not under the slave name, as our sister was delving into. The name is a very important thing. It describes exactly who you are, what your history is, the meaning of your life individually, as well as collectively among your people. It has a story to it. So I have the last name Islam. Some people will have disagreements with that for the lack of understanding and then others will understand that it simply means peace or means peace that you receive by submitting your will to doing the will of God. So I was born in Compton, youngest of 10 children. Mama strong, 10 children, okay. Uh, I'm the tallest, but I'm the youngest. And uh, I was born in 1990. So at this time, the Crips were heavily active. The Crips, which stood for community resistance in progress, it was a variation from community revolution in progress. It was created to fight against racist police officers. You know that. That was the origin, the Bloods as well. Oakland, California, from there all the way down, which originated from the Black Panthers prior to that Nation of Islam. So we have all been connected with the same purpose of fighting against racism in different ways under different names. Um, what I experienced growing up in Compton, each one of you touched on a piece, especially with that 127 what? church's chicken. Yeah. <laughs> God, you know, the biscuits was crazy. Yeah. Okay, so um, growing up in Compton, I loved it because I wasn't aware that we were in the condition that we were in. Right. And when you're young, you know, your brothers and sisters, they don't want you to know that. And your mother's working hard. You know, if your father, he's in your life, he's working hard. They're doing their best to make it seem like you have everything when you really don't have anything at all. Mm -hmm. And that was what it was like, and that is what it was. We were on food stamps, EBT, everything you can name, we were on it. Um, the government assistance, it, it was exactly um, what we came up under when food stamps looked like Chinese money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand if you remember that. <laughs> Green, the, the orange and white, the brown, the blue and white, right? Like Chinese money. So, um, I didn't know until I was about four years old, I was used to my brother, his name was Mustafa. We all have Arabic names, we were all born in the nation of Islam. And he would come to the house and drive his little red car to the front almost every day. And I would run outside, see my big brother, I slam legging brother, big bro, big bro. But one day he didn't come back home. Next day he didn't come back home. Third day he didn't come back home. My brothers and sisters told me that he went to work and he was going to be gone for quite some time. About three or four years later, it wasn't until I was about eight years old that they told me that he was murdered in a drug deal by his best friend. Now, this is the reality, once again, that they were keeping away from me because they didn't want me to grow up hating a part of myself, grow up disliking my own people because it was someone who looked like us that did it to him. They did not want me to know about drugs. They did not want me to know about game banging, even though I knew how to crip walk before I could talk. <laughs> Being real, all right? So these were the things that, that I had to be raised in. And once I hit seven and a half, eight years old, that is when I delved into, I was tossed into the reality of crack, the reality of heroin, the reality of bloods and crips and the police officers murdering my people. I would, I would always hear these gunshots, but I'm thinking it's fireworks. You know, I mean, I'm hearing this, I'm, I'm seeing these lights and everything down the street. I'm seeing my homeboys there one day and not there the next. I didn't understand what was going on. My sister, the oldest of all 10 of us, was on skid row for 20 years on crack cocaine. See, these are the things that we have to communicate to the children so that they can know there is a reality. But it does not mean that that will be your reality. You just know that is... There, there is a hidden hand, as the sister said, that is still there today. The difference is many of them are blatant, and then the other ones are those right here. Uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us that many of us, many of you, he said this a year ago, when people were asking him, so who is the real enemy? Is it, is it still all white people? Some of you may say yes, some of you may say no. 
said, no, 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 it's not all white people. He said, because we live among people every day, among white people all the time, right? Ray, raise your hand if you, you got some white friends. It's okay, it's okay, we in a BSU, it's okay. okay. They're like, nah, I can't do it right now. Okay, all right, so we, we have white friends, or associates, or acquaintances, whatever will make you feel comfortable. And he said, no, 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 he said, the problem is that the real enemy is your ignorance, number one. He said, because many of you, he was talking to us brothers, because the men in the black community are the ones who have dropped the ball. I'm gonna say this again, and brothers, we can talk outside if you wanna do that. <laughs> but we have dropped the ball, partially because we were ripped from our masculinity, ripped from our power and ability to govern ourselves and our women and our children. We were destroyed and completely ripped inside out, upside down. So by the time we now rediscover parts of ourselves, we're being taught by a man who's not really a man on how to be partially, maybe a fifth of a man, of what he thinks is a man, which is something that destroys women, destroys children, destroys the community. So we're trying, we were trying to do our best. So my point is, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, many of you are no longer black men, you are white men in black skin. Amen. And he said that because he said, you are murdering your own people without any type of feeling. And you point at the white man all day long, yet you murder yourself with this hand and you point at the white man with this. Now the system of white supremacy definitely exists. And that system will be destroyed the moment we decide to come together and unite with one another. Brothers and sisters, men and women. Growing up and understanding this is something that helped me to look at, okay, I am not going to sit here and watch this happen to my people. When I was nine years old, I decided to do something about it. I really need to update that resume. <laughs> I really do. Um, and I'll just give you a quick brief before, uh, after that, that little snippet of the resume, I had gone on to become a member of the Nation of Islam actively. Uh, I had done many things, including uh, met with some of the scientists at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, who were whistleblowers who exposed the connection between the MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine to autism in black boys in particular, which they give autism to black boys at the rate of 236% more than Caucasian boys. These are white scientists, not black scientists. The hepatitis B vaccine gives autism to black boys at the rate of 500% more than Caucasian boys. And the entire system of the CDC and vaccines have been completely, in the modern time, to eradicate black and brown people. And that did not come from Brother Reza, Minister Farrakhan, that came from Dr. William Thompson, who is still currently the senior lead scientist over the Center for Disease Control's Vaccine Division. That's one of the things, as well as helping to reunite the bloods and the crypts, with Snoop Dogg game and a lot of the hood leaders. Another thing that I've done, a lot of different things, but the point is that the work has not stopped. The work must continue and it is all of us in this room that will make our new reality, which is true freedom, justice, and equality, a true reality among our people. I just wanna say thank you to all these responses, thank you. And as Dr. Higgins said, with reclaiming our blackness. Unfortunately, our people have a mindset of division among being black, being African, being original, African American, and et cetera, right? So, um, what is considered the most significant divide amongst continental Africans and Africans within the diaspora? And basically, what, are, what could be some solutions or a code that we can follow to remedy. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> uh, well, I th there's so many layers to this, but I think the first one is that we're totally ignorant of each other, and uh, we're to also totally ignorant of ourselves and our identity. So rarely, and I'm speaking just for Kenya, do we learn about our history. Our history starts with we were basically like barbarians in the forest, mm -hmm. and then the colonialists came and civilized us. And the mistake they've made is that the same education system that my mother went through is the same education system that I'm going through, and is the same education system that 
you know, children my, who could be my child are going through. So we haven't changed our education systems to really reflect what we as Africans need to know, who we are, where we came from, the fact that our history didn't start 100 years ago. We weren't found in the, in the forest. So that's part of that, the, the ignorance of our own identity. And then we don't really know much about the African-American story. So, you know, a few of us have seen Roots, let's say, uh, you know, um, and that was maybe in the 80s and 90s, but we don't really know what happened. We don't even know much about the transatlantic slave trade, and maybe this is an East African thing, so I'd have to, like, ask, um, you know, my brothers and sisters from West Africa, but we are completely ignorant of, of history, and that is why there's this divide. Then we also have to realize that there's a document that was signed um, during the Carter presidency where there was... Um, a covert plan to keep us separate, right, to correct. keep our leaders separate, to keep our revolutionaries separate, and to keep us separate. And so, you know, we take these things lightly, but it's real. So, um, because when we, when African nations started gaining independence in the 60s, it was like a domino effect. So it started with Ghana, and within like the decade, all the nations were free, but a lot of them had partnered with African-American revolutionaries. And there was a, a brilliant plan, but a lot of them were assassinated, a lot of them were, um, you know, taken out in coups and stuff, and then they, we were kept apart. So I think that, it for me, the solution is building bridges, and that's why my main message has always been, get a passport, come and visit Africa. You know, people are like, I don't want to move. You know, it's not about moving. It's like, just pick a country. There's 54 nations. You know, um, we're a hospitable, loving people, wherever you go. Come and visit, and that will totally shift your, I can't, I can't tell you how that will affect you. And also, I encourage my fellow Africans, visit the US, you know, have, have that experience. So that's one of the things. And I think there has to be a re-education. So those who are woke, those who are exposed, have a responsibility to share the knowledge and to share the information with as many people as possible. Because that is, the ignorance is what is killing us, as you had mentioned earlier. I would say that the biggest divisive, just to add on to what you said, sis, the kind of biggest divide is the lack of awareness that we have linked interest globally. That if you are not aware that your interests are linked with black people all over the world, then you're not going to be thinking globally. Some people are not even thinking in terms of domestically within the country that they need to function collectively with black people. Like, how is it that we can engage in any type of transformative political work if we can't even come to the conclusion that we have linked interest, right? And so it's interesting because I, I have this conversation with my friends and my colleagues all the time. What is the goal? Oh, you know, we got black liberation, black liberation, black unification. Sounds good. All right. I need some practical talking points about this. I need, it, I need it to be broken down structurally a bit. Are we talking about banking black, developing black institutions, developing black communities economically, um, beginning to um, kind of chip away at the ramifications of the psychological white supremacy that has infiltrated our minds? All of these things, very important. Are we talking about globally um, throughout African nations, throughout the Caribbean, being in conversation about the history of our linked interests and the future of us in some, in some way, shape, or form figuring out how to work together. I think that if we can come to conclusions about where we stand ideologically, then we'll be able to get more done. So when I was in um, undergrad and college, um, I came across, you know, I came in um, to a, a, a dorm that was uh, of uh, uh, 
Africans in America, or rather black American girls, so y'all, for the sake of conversation, I want us to be able to distinguish uh, black American girls, and I was the only kind of like first generation African in my dorm. And I realized that there was some level of like ignorance around like what it meant for me to be African. It's like, oh, you African, you, you, it was a kind of exotication, right? It's like, oh, you interesting, but it was also like an intrigue, associate, but also a, a bit of ignorance around like, oh, you know, what is it like in Africa? So I, I didn't, I didn't allow for some of the ignorant comments to frustrate me in terms of like, oh, y'all live in huts or what, what y'all got over there, because I understood that that was an outgrowth of a system of education that had failed them to not understand what it, what the political economic structures in Africa actually are. I am lucky enough to have been able to have the opportunity to travel there when I was uh, young. Right, so I was able to dispel whatever myths I had about where it is that my family came from. And of course, when I'm with my family that is Nigerian, my biological family, I hear the remarks about the African Americans, the black Americans always just getting into trouble and uh, going just criminal something. It's not, you know, and this kind of distinguishing between the two groups, which is like, um, what, you know, it's a certain point before the kind of like African identity became something that is that people want to identify with, and this is over the course of like the last few years that like people really started to become inquisitive about Africa, right? Like, you know, um, wanting to learn more and travel there, but that it wasn't necessarily so much a thing. Um, maybe up until a few years ago. You know, even with the advent of Black Panther and all of the rest, folks are more interested in Africa than they were in the past. And so I realized that what I was seeing was the ignorance um, on the side of some of my sisters and brothers over here, and even the ignorance on the side of some of my family members that didn't understand the condition that black American people, or rather that African people in, African people in America had to face. I was like, oh, you know, why is it that they haven't been able to strive and, 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 and build for themselves and do all of these things? To not understand that the trauma as that, that the African people suffer from as an outgrowth of colonialism is different from the trauma that African people in America have suffered after the outgrowth of chattel slavery. We have to be able to distinguish between those two things and not criminalize each other for not understanding each other, but to be empathetic about our different histories and different types of trauma so that we can move toward a functional collectivity. But there has to be some level of patience, understanding, empathy, to be able to communicate with each other. And the reason that I feel like I've been able to have some level of empathy is because I understand many different types of perspectives about how people feel about or engage their blackness. Some people feel like, listen, all we gotta do is, you know, black economics, bank black, buy black, build the black institutions, all very important domestically within the country. But that really can only get you so far if you're not thinking globally. People say, why is it that black Amer bear with me, why is it that black American people have not been able to, on a world stage, present the argument that there has been civil rights violations against black American people or African people in, African people in America? Civil rights, human rights violations still to this day. When the Japanese people were put in internment camps for two years um, during World War II, what happened? The Jap Japan said, Y'all got us messed up. And what did they do? They took them to the UN and said, y'all gonna pay for this. And Japanese people got their reparations. Listen, right. Black American people or African people, African people in America have not received reparations, have not received even acknowledgement of their human rights violations consistently being uh, under attack and uh, challenged and uh, you, you understand. And so why is that so? Because there's no African or black nation somewhere else in the globe that will vouch for you on a global platform. 
And so when you just say, we just gonna keep it, and I see people do this, where the black nationalism becomes so domestic that you don't even really wanna talk about anything outside of America, you're doing yourself a disservice. When we're talking about human rights violations that happen to black people every day, when we're talking about drugs being funneled into the hood and then the CIA getting away with that, when we're talking about the mass incarceration of black communities, when we're talking about police brutality, the obvious, right? Why is it that that hasn't been able to be addressed? Because you don't have an international body to vouch for you that your human rights violation So when we talk about Pan-Africanism and global black unification, it's not, cute. it's not to be cute, well, we go be family, you know. No, it's about, this is actually politically economic strategy around how can the situation be changed first, Black American people or African people in America need to identify as a nation. That feels very radical for a lot of people. Oh, you're trying to do reverse segregation and all kind of other stuff. <laughs> Listen, all of these other ethnicities have been able to function collectively and create some level of economic stability for themselves. In order for you to function collectively, it doesn't mean that you hate the next group. It means that you love your people enough to be able to survive, to be able to create some type of situation where you might be able to, I don't know, have an inheritance That's to, right. you know, pass on to your child if capitalism is the name of the game. But then what do we do? We, we argue with each other. Never get to the point where we can have this conversation. Oh, we don't have to do black nationalism because that's capitalism and capitalism is bad and because capitalism is bad then we can't. Listen, I understand. I get it. Capitalism is actually indeed the way that it's functioned in this country treacherous. But in the meantime, as this exists, black people do need to figure out a more strategic way about how to function politically and economically, healthfully, collectively, and be able to do that. I'm running too long, but y'all understand. Yeah. before the next panelist continues, I forgot to mention. Um, so we're gonna have a Q&A period once the discussion comes to an end. Um, but we're gonna have a few, we have a couple volunteers sitting in the crowd with um, paper and pens. So we're gonna collect your questions and then we'll um, revisit them at the end for Q&A. So I just wanted to make sure I let you all know that, but you all can continue. Thank you, the responses are like really good so far. So I'm getting the, the nudge to go. Uh, next. So I, I think for me, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and there are a lot of things that I'm, I'm putting into thought. Um, and so try to follow me. But I think about a book that I just recently read by Dr. Joy DeRoy, uh, Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. And as a black person who's lived here in America my entire life and has not had the opportunity um, for various reasons, right? I, I do have a passport. I have the, the fiscal opportunity to travel and do things now. But there's this element that is connected to this book that I've been reading or I, I have read about the fear that lingers around me in terms of my lived experience here. Um, and even in the moments where I think I'm soaring or the moments that I think I'm doing really well, there's still this essence of fear that still follows me. And so I think for me as a black African queer person who lives in this world. I'm navigating the fear of white people. I'm navigating the fear, and I'm just gonna call it, I'm, I'm navigating the fear of some black people. I'm also navigating the fear of myself, and I'm also navigating the fear of what was passed down to me. How many of you are familiar with epigenetics? Okay, I think there, there is a conversation of folks saying that that's not a real thing, but when I see how my mom responds to police, how I see how my father responds to police, my uncle, my cousins, everybody in my family, when they're telling me don't go over there, or don't go to Redlands, or don't go over, you know, don't get caught in Beverly Hills after a certain time, that piece of that the that family has had throughout the duration of my life. And so I always go back to this book. If you haven't read the book, and, I, and it's not a plug, but I think it, there's something so real about it, this idea of constantly living in this place of fear and having to navigate it, and how many people don't want to accept this idea of how the world is created around us as black people to be fearful. And something that is very interesting to me, Eric Deggins said it um, when I was recently in Florida, he had made a comment, he said, white, he said it's, it's not the idea that uh, racism or whiteness is, is, um, is not real, it's invisible. And I think about that a lot, this idea how invisible it is and how people create this world around you um, to say that whatever you're going through does not really exist. The easiest way, at least for me, this is what I've had to kind of step away from in my own lived experience, what is the easiest way to tire somebody out? to keep them moving in circles. And so as black people, that's what I've learned in my own life. I've had to stop in the middle of things and go, wait a second, I 
see what you're doing. You're trying to keep me busy so that way I tire out. And, the, and I feel like that's what, when we talk about the divide, right? So we create the tension on that side of the, of the world and we create the tension on this side of the world. And if we can keep that tension going, then the Africans are too tired to fight their battle and the African-Americans, quote unquote, um, again, and I'm not using that as African-Americans, I identify as black, but the, <laughs> the idea that if I can keep black people, African people fighting in America, both of them will be too tired to unite. And so I always tell people, and I say this on Twitter a lot and I get a lot of retweets for it, the day that black people unite and fight, God bless everybody. <laughs> Up. And I don't say this, as somebody, I mean, I recognize that you, I get this a lot too, because people go, well, how can you be so pro-black, but you're also so pro-queer, and you're also so pro-this? I say, all of those things have to work together in order for me to survive. And so I tell people all of the time that I recognize the system because the, the system has already recognized me. And I've, all, I, I've spent my entire life, even throughout my dissertation process, I tell people all the time, my dissertation was on the experiences of queer students of color in higher education. My dissertation got kicked back four times before they said yes because they did not want me doing the study at the institution I was at. And I had to step back and ask myself, why? And I always go back to this idea of what happened to Malcolm X, what happened to Martin Luther King, what happened to, uh, uh, to a whole bunch of Sojourner of Truth, all these people who have, who have dealt with oppression, right? The easiest way is once they, the, the easiest way for freedom is to be educated. And the moment that I can actively know how the oppression works around me, then I become too smart for you or I, I get hip to your game. And so I'm just thinking about that a lot, this idea of how, you know, people always tell me, you have to learn to play the game, you have to learn to play the game. And I say, F that. Yep. I'm not learning to play anybody's game because I recognize what the game is, and even for as a black American, I recognize how the game has been played globally. And so now I write about that a lot. I, I recognize the system in entertainment. If I can create this, this rhetoric around black people in entertainment, then you start to believe it to be true and you buy into that. And I tell people all the time, well, well why is that, right? I, I've had ve various conversations with Viola Davis about her role um, on how to get away with murder this season, right? And if nobody is really watching the show, it's a great indentation of what, what black women are faced with in a world that is not built for them. And so I've always, I've kind of centered that in my whole entire rhetoric of the work that I do, that I have to exist in a space that's not built for me, and my responsibility is to make sure that I peep game and keep calling that out so other people can wake up too. Mm, yeah. I'm very mindful of, of my words. Um, you know, the question about uh, the significant divide and um, you know, how we identify ourselves and solutions and what codes to follow. Um, I think <coughs> one of the biggest issues that we have is that we're trying to tell each other what to identify <coughs> as. I identify as a black woman not because my skin is the black, like people say, why would you call yourself a color crayon, right? But on the backs of my books, I have a picture of myself as a child and I have a DNA structure linking to myself with a, uh, a, a crown on my head, the Egyptian crown on my head, signifying alchemy, which is taking lead and transmuting it into gold. The physical reflection of that is where we are as a people, di globally, the diaspora, right? The concept of where we struggle at, oppression, abuse, injustice, all of these things is led. However, there are some among us that have already transmuted into gold. We lead all of our conversations all of our agendas, our organizations, our platforms, our panel discussions, our get-togethers, our social media conversations from a mindset of lack. Everything is about what we don't do. Everything is about who we are not. Everything is about what we didn't do last year or what didn't get accomplished in the last. I put a, the, the flyer up on my social media page and somebody came on and said, well, you know, I hope you guys aren't just coming and doing all and talking. It's too much talk. This is, a, this is an institution of learning. Right. 
there's a language that's being expressed right now between all of us that has nothing to do with words. So it doesn't matter if you speak English or Arabic or Spanish or Chinese or whatever language you're fluent in. This brother said he deals with the issue of having to express himself and explain himself and to constantly worry about what people are thinking about him and how they are going to receive him based on his sexual orientation. But from a spiritual perspective and from God consciousness, before we ever knew anything about what your sexuality was, you introduced yourself when you walked in the room. Everybody introduced themselves when they walked into the room. So for me, knowing what I know, right? I say I identify as a black woman, but I have a degree in African studies. I started studying African culture and African history from the age of 17 years old and got totally immersed in it. Totally in awe of Songhai and Ghana and Timbuktu and all these great nations, Kemet and all of the, the wonderful historic uh, achievements that we uh, came to be, that we, that we experienced. This concept, the African proverb that says, many gods, one creator, what does that mean? Many gods, one creator. We are spiritual beings here having a human experience. 99% of our reality is the unseen. So everything that you see right now, all of us sitting here, this building, this great institution of learning, the airport, the streets, the roads, the trees, is only 1% of our reality. So what does that mean? That means that the real power is in the unseen. That means that the real power is in how you think. How could we as a people expect to see change in our communities if 80 to 90% of what we talk about is negative? How could we expect, you, we come in here, and I don't take this lightly because I know that, you know, everybody in here is a universe unto yourself. You've got professors, you've got counselors, you've got family members, you've got mothers and fathers and children, you have a job, you have a business, you go into the bank, you have a car, you pay bills. You read, you study, you have a social media platform. Everybody in here is a universe unto themselves. So for me to sit here, the only, my only job is to speak to the God in you. That's right. I don't want to speak to the nigga. Mm -hmm. I don't want to speak to the downtrodden. Mm -hmm. I don't want to speak to the oppressed. I don't want to speak to the victimized. I don't want to speak to the woe is me. I want to speak to the God in you. That's where the power is. So, coming from that perspective, for me, if you say I'm a Muslim, I say assalamu alaikum. If you say I am a Moor, I say Islam. If you say I represent African Pan-Africanism, I say hotel. If you say I'm a street soldier, I say peace. If you say I'm from the nation of gods and earth, I say peace to the gods and earth. We've got to learn, we, we talk so much about freedom, but we really don't want to let each other be free. Everybody in here has goals and aspirations for their lives, and everybody in here in one, on one level or another is dealing with some level of pain. I'm not gonna sit up here and ask you to sacrifice yourself for the revolution because if we do not start building individuals of sound mind and body, there is no revolution. We're trying to build institutions on the backs of broken people. <laughs> Hear you? You see what I'm saying? So for me, when we talk about a code of conduct, speak to the God in one another. Represent life, represent light. If you've never been loved, then be love. A lot of us don't know what love is. We talk about, you know what I'm saying, going back and studying the history and studying the culture and globalism and all of those things are important and I've done all of those things, but I wasn't raised in love. I didn't know what that actually looked like, what it felt like until I actually started to recognize what it actually, what, what is God? You know what I'm saying? What is the universe? What is our place in all of this? 
as a people, I got stuck on slavery. So we went from Imhotep to Nat Turner. We went from building pyramids to smoking crack. How does that work? It was that process of me, I spent three years in college just studying, didn't have nothing to do with my degree. Okay, white people did, uh, let me go study European history. What was so great about them? What did they? <laughs> we were lacking something in the African experience that the creator had to put us through a certain sojourn in order to purify us so that we could get to the next level of consciousness. That's where we are right now. So for me, whether you say fear like four or five times, I, I, I don't have any fear. I understand that what I'm saying to you right now, if you take this information and you leave with it, you, you can go and build a world. You can build a kingdom. There is no limitation on us. So for me, you know what I mean, it's, it's, I listen to us. I've written books about this. I've studied it. I've researched. There, you know, she said white supremacy is not really white supremacy. It's white inferiority. That's right and exact. But we, where are we supreme? Where, do we st where are we contributing to the global conversation? What does the world see us as a people besides Cardi B and hip hop and rap culture? All of that is, is, is beautiful and we embrace all of that. But for me, I take the history, and I'm about to end this because I can talk. I take the greatness and the vastness of African history our history as a global people, the indigenous people all around the world. I take the slave trade, I take Jim Crow, I take the plight of the 80s and 90s with drugs and crack cocaine and the war on drugs and police brutality. I take where we are today with social media and you know what I'm saying, Wakanda forever and you know what I mean, our reclaiming ourselves and black women loving their hair and us loving our culture and appreciating all of the beauty who we are. I put all of that in a pot and mix it up because the black experience in America is critical to what's happening in the world right now. The consciousness of the world is being greatly impacted by us right here, right now. This is a fact. If we can teach the rest of the world to be, to turn up and get lit and, you know what I'm saying, all the things that we do, which rap is only a spinoff from what happens in the hood. If we can guide and teach the world from that direction, what if we taught the world as women? What if the world was talking about the, 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 the power and the prowess of the mind of the black woman, the two wombs, this womb and the womb down here, opposed to one of our beautiful sisters doing a video pretending to give head. No disrespect, no judgment, you know what I'm saying? But I'm talking about consciousness. The mind is the solution. The mental prowess, what we think about, what we feel, we are vibrational beings. What I'm saying, if you feel the truth of my spirit, it is resonating with you. That's vibration. That's physics. That's science. We're talking about a deeper level. We're in the time right now where we got to go to a deeper level. That's, that's my answer to that question. <laughs> because these are all factors, pieces, and components of exactly the reality, as Sister Zaza Ali said, that we are facing and what we are living in. The question dealing with Africa and what is the Great Divide, Africa, as well as those on the, this area of America, the corporation, or some call it the country. The major divide, number one, is our ignorance, as was stated earlier. Number two, it is our understanding or thought that we are all different from one another. And that comes from our ignorance. I can get up here, as Zaza said, and say Islam to my Moorish family, Shalom to my Hebrew Israelite family, Aslam alaikum to my Muslim family, uh, peace be with you to my Christian family, because Jesus also said, peace be with you in the book of John, the 21st chapter, the 20th verse. I can go into all of these different greetings, which are inside of a soup of our melanated pot of rulership. These are all different languages, different greetings, different ways of talking to the same people. 
Does that, does that make sense? Yes, sir. So the number one problem is our ignorance. Number two is our thought or idea that we are different. And number three, it is our fear of returning to our greatness. Mm -hmm. Because we feel, this is why the enemy uses this against us. You have a cell phone, yes? I do. Right now, we literally have the whole world in our hands. You do recognize that, right? <coughs> I can get on FaceTime and talk to a brother sister in Nairobi, Kenya. I can talk to someone over in Germany. I can talk to someone in Canada right now. We have the whole world in our hands. So the issue is, why are we not connecting? See, we can go and say the system of white supremacy to a degree, that exists, yes. But they are using this to attack your mind, as the sister said, I'm about to, I'm about to dovetail off each one of y'all. Because you all hit on things, so all I'm doing is just bringing this to a very end. I'm gonna give me about 60 more seconds for those of you who know that's pretty much how fast I talk on Instagram, and I will speed up my videos. It's actually real. So, <laughs> because our attention span is low. That's true. Is that right? Yeah, so, yes. the, the point is, we need to be able to get this out and get to work as quickly as possible. So, they utilize this and they have mind control mechanisms going out right now. Yeah. Facebook is a CIA organization. Yeah. Yes. You know that. Yes. Instagram also, CIA organization. Snapchat is a facial recognition yes. software created by the CIA in order for you to give them access to all of the profiles of your face. Say it. So they Say can it. see you anywhere at any time. They put the chips in here to track everything that you do, all of your conversations, etc. Why am I saying this? Because this is the tool that we can use to unite our people faster than anything else. But the enemy has found a way, they originated it to spy on us, but now we are using it to spy on them. And they never expected that to happen, which is why now they are trying to shut it down. So with us as a people, we have to understand, one, we are original people. Whether you call yourself Muslim, if you call yourself Asiatic, you call yourself Moor, you call yourself Hebrew, you call yourself African, all of these are great names. But to be very frank, these are names which separate the people. We are the original people. Can we agree on that? that our sister has to focus so much attention on saying, now hold on, I know you don't like the word black, but just for the sake of talking, African American over here, right? that demonstrates a very big problem. So for the sake of it, we can say we are the original people. We can just say we are original. Everybody who wants to talk would just say we are original. If you have one drop of melanated blood, original blood, you are an original person. If you go into the linguistics, if you go into the, uh, the etymology of words, you can go into Asiatic. Some of y'all might not agree. But that is also a fact as well. So my point on this is we have to understand that we are one people. Do not allow anyone to, oh, peace to my brother. Do not allow anyone to utilize your ignorance against you to come against your own brother or sister. No more. Fear is something that you must overcome. And I say this as a young brother. I don't care if 50 police officers coming up in here. We taking them out if they come after the system. I don't care what anybody says. Because when you teach a man, you teach an individual. When you teach a woman, you are teaching a nation. She is worth at least three of us. 75% of the work that we are taught is with the woman. Heaven lies at the foot of the black woman. Some of y'all brothers don't like that. I'm going to say it again. <laughs> this is what we are talking next, because I know some people are like, oh, y'all got these women walking 10 paces behind y'all and they have covered, force her to cover up. No, hold on, hold on, hold on, chill out. But we're not Arabs That's right. in Arabia. You have to separate Arab culture from the practice of peace, which is Islam. That's, we didn't learn that, that stuff. You can't have no black woman. You walk 10 pace behind you and I get a shoe upside your head. Correct? <laughs> See, there's a level of respect. As it was in ancient Kemet, we ruled side by side. But the woman's intellect and mentality, that logical, strategic side, is what we have always venerated and honored. Because she is the greatest protector of us. She is our first teacher. That's right. Is that right? I gotta say this about the sisters because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that the reason why the world is in the condition that it is in today is because of the disrespect of the woman. And a lot of us, you can clap, it's okay, you better clap for the sisters. Let me know if I'm getting too loose, y'all. Disrespect the mic. But the condition that we're in now the enemy is playing off of our fear and our ignorance so much 
and it's right in your face. They are disrespecting you. When I say they, it's not just white people. That's not what I'm saying. Anyone who is a devil to someone is a devil. There isn't such thing as a black devil now. That is a man or woman who decides to kill and harm his or her own people. You have been, become infected by that system of white supremacy to where you feel you must harm another person because that is your only way of surviving. Yes, sir. We have to get rid or purge ourselves of that, but we have to understand that fear and ignorance are the two greatest things that we must overcome. And if you are not willing to give your life, as Brother was talking about, we will never get through this. Mm -hmm. You are so, we are so afraid of becoming great because every day we see ourselves getting murdered on the street for no reason. And so inside of your body, you have this response chemically, which makes you think if I stand up, raise my voice, protect my sister, I'm going to die. This is what the subconscious mind does to you. And so then when you talk about reconnecting with Africa, you think of Brother Malcolm, you think about all of our leaders, you're like, no, nah, no, they're going to kill me if I do that. See, see, this, this, this nonsense has to stop. And it has to start with the brothers because the sisters have now taken over the lead for the revolution. Yes, sir. Because we have failed to take our place where we need to be. That's right. Come on, come on. So, I know that was only the first question, right? But I'll say, okay, woo. Man, it's right here. So brothers and sisters, we have to unite as a people collectively and stop being separated over petty labels. It does not, that, it doesn't work no more because the police officers don't ask you your damn religion when they murder you in the street. They don't ask you. You a Muslim? I ain't gonna shoot you. I'm gonna shoot that, that RBG brother over there. You a Moor? Now you know the law, I ain't gonna mess with you. Boy, that does work. Okay, but, but, but the point is, they don't ask you these different things. You are shot because that is what they are trained to do. Casual Killing Act 1669. They are murdering you because that's what they do. So my point is, if they are willing to see us all as one people, why can't we see ourselves as one people? Just, you know, adding on to what our brother Riza Islam has said, even in just your conclusion, that also known as Malcolm X, said in one of his most noted speeches, The Ballad of the Bullet, that don't get killed because you're a Christian or because you're a Muslim or because what have you. You know the reason why you're attacked is because you're black. I think that what we have, what we've done now is we've set the playing field for a conversation about the fact that we agree upon the reality that we have an interest in functioning as a collective. Right. We agree on this? That's right. Okay. We agree. What we, the reason, and, and so we've been able to agree on this before. Last year, when I sat right here, we agreed on that, on the same panel. But we, I, but it didn't feel like we left with any real practical solutions as to how to really do that. And I want to say, why is that? Don't confuse motion with movement. Just motion means that you're doing stuff. Movement means that you're going forward. You know, folks always think, oh, we, we in the movement, we doing the movement work. Don't confuse just talking and doing, but with, without, with, don't confuse talking. Now, talking is okay if we're communicating and educating ourselves but there's other work that needs to do, be done in terms of movement. And that work is gonna be, first and foremost, coming to conclusions about how are we in relationship with one another. So if, for instance, uh, Brother said that, you know, we need to understand the intellect of a woman, of a black woman. Absolutely. That has been one of our greatest contentions about why black people have not been able to function as a collectivity. That's Do y'all understand where I'm going yes, with that? Ma when I say one of our greatest contentions, one of our greatest issues that we haven't been able to overcome. So, I am a woman, a black woman, who fully acknowledges my intellectual capacity and will not um, have anybody tell me that I am not fully intellectually capable as a human being, as an African woman, yes, right? And so, Interestingly enough, some of us, as African people, have been bamboozled into believing a gendered system of hierarchy that was never ours to begin with. It is quite literally, because folks always uh, talk about the teachings of ancient Kemet in, in these spaces, 
of both the way in which the ancient Kemetic traditions taught us about how to live with great balance, collectivity, reciprocity, y'all with me on that. Now, of course, even just with the small information that I've said there, we would understand that uh, mistreating, devaluating, or devaluing, or um, assuming that uh, one particular black person is not um, uh, valuable as another black person is against the law of my act. Right. But interestingly enough, here we gonna go. Myself, as a black woman who critiques gendered hierarchies, then it becomes a controversial issue. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It becomes a controversial issue when I say black men and black women can function as a collectivity in a way where we are not assuming that there's some illogical hierarchy that exists there. What I'm saying is a critique of a system that was never ours to begin with oh, you know, the African man needs to be a proper African man, and the African woman needs to be a proper African woman. Please tell me where you got your ideas about what a proper African man and a proper African woman is. A lot of the time when I hear people have these conversations, they're not founded on any true empirical data, evidence, or history about the way in which African people functioned before the introduction or influence of whiteness. Are you still with me? Yeah. And so when we're talking about African civilizations, pre-colonial African civilizations, if you look at the history of it, that there was great contention, yes, gendered contention, that there was their great uh, difficulty, but there was also very much systems of reciprocity, equality, um, being able to deal with each other as equal human beings. So I do have a concern and a question about how we're supposed to move forward if we assume that my role as a woman is just to, you know, make babies and keep the house clean and, because if I took that to be true, then I wouldn't be here right. talking to you right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so we have to be able to understand that black women, that women can be within their femininity and function within their femininity without stifling them and saying that you have to stay within this small boundary of what it means to be a woman and this person needs to stay within this small boundary of what it means to be a man. Our understandings of black masculinity and femininity have been colonized. We just don't want to talk about it. We don't want to talk about it. Do you know why? Because chattel slavery dehumanizes you. And it makes it so that you cannot engage in these institutions in society, in mainstream society. You can't get married. You can't even function like a quote unquote normal family as an outgrowth of the white supremacy, anti-blackness, chattel slavery that happened in this country. So when you have black people then that exist outside of the norms of what we think is supposed to be right, we view that as a threat to our stability. Are y'all still with me? Yes, and so we need to be able to have those conversations because I just see how we freeze up when that happens. We don't want to talk about those difficult things. And so as a black woman who challenges not only a system of colonialism, a system of global white supremacy, I also challenge any system that is founded on illogical hierarchy. I look at all systems, including patriarchy. Are you still with me? Yes. yes. And so we need to be able to do that or else we're going to devalue and undermine half of our population. Mm. Did you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, if we don't challenge a system that is founded on an illogical hierarchy, we will devalue and undermine our women. So it's not enough to say that the black woman is strong and fierce and, 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 and powerful. It is to say she's just as capable. She's just as capable. I just want to say something real quick, and it's kind of um, from Brother Riz, Riz's uh, statement, um, as well as what the sister just said. Um, for me, I think it is a, it, from African perspective, from indigenous culture perspectives, the women are spiritual and emotional leaders. Yeah, I say, y'all feel me? 
I see so much finger pointing at our men. <laughs> and rightfully so, right? Brother Islam talked about what the men, our brothers' shortcomings and how the brothers you know, need to do this and do that. That's actual fact, right? As a woman and as a spiritual and emotional leader, right? Um, I think that especially in this day and time right now where the conversation about you know, uh, Me Too, about the rape culture, about all of these things that are prevalent in our society, which all of these conversations are valid, warranted, you know what I mean? Like the, the consciousness of this country right now, which is leading the consciousness of the world, where we have been, the, 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 the hierarchy of patriarchy, the concept of, you know, the man being the, you know, decision maker on all fronts, all of those things are valid. I take nothing away from that. I think we have to be very careful as a people because the same way the sister said, we, we risk uh, marginalizing, I can't remember exactly what she said, half of our community. We're also risking margin, marginalizing half of our community, which is our men. I think it is, is very important for us, particularly me as a woman, to speak to the heart and to the soul and to the nature and to the ruler in black men. Right? I feel most of the brothers that I know that I work with in counseling and in traveling around this country, a lot of our men have been failed by their mothers. That's not, <laughs> so you know what I mean? It's not about, I don't do finger pointing, we don't do blame, this is about pure self accountability, right? So as a woman, I'm always taking accountability for my shortcomings and the shortcomings of the women that preceded me and that taught me. A lot of us as women have failed our men. Not just mothers, but aunties and grandmothers. I mean, look at all the conversations we have about sexual molestation and it comes out that this grandmother or that auntie didn't want somebody to tell and didn't want it to get exposed because of whatever reason, right? So for me, I think we have to be very careful right now in this climate where, you know, we're, we're coming together and we're talking about things that have, the oppression that have been imposed upon women. We got to be careful about this swapping war stories, energy without any real intention of healing. In order to heal our women, we have to heal our men. The two have to go hand in hand. I have a 15 year old. I mean, people say I, I, I bash black men or I hate men. No, I have a son. You know what I'm saying? So he is just as important to me, whether I have a son or not. Our brothers are just as important to me as it is to speak life into our women. So for the brothers in the room and anybody that, that may watch this later and the energy that will resonate from this, I think that I'm very proud of where you are right now standing strong, staying true to, you know, what you know to be true, seeking the ruler within yourself, seeking God within your own consciousness through African concepts, through school, through being students, through being a student of life, um, and trying to resurrect the best part of yourself to change things around. You catch a lot of the flack for what's wrong in our communities, but you are a reflection of so much of what is right in our communities. And I just want to make sure that, you understand, we stay balanced when we talk about our, when we talk about our men because if we're the spiritual and emotional leaders, then we have to take take the lead in speaking life into our men. I just wanted to say that. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, to touch on Zaza, what you were saying about you know speaking into speaking the God and the ruler into one another is oftentimes what I feel like is the only answer or the only way in which we can unify and and come together as a community. Really changing the dialogue and really, really focusing back on each other individually um, and speaking about how powerful we are individually and how that changes, you know, the, the collective community conscious and everything like that. As we you know, as we know, and you know, as Dr. Claude Emerson will be speaking later in terms of economics being um, the root of our oppression, how, in, in terms of what you're saying, I'm, I'm considering that to be like a solution, but 
Are there any other solutions or any other ways in which you all can identify um, continental and Africans around the diaspora to strategically organize, to strategize, to step into global leadership and economics, policy, and morality in terms of um, for us to, you know, continue our unification as a community. For anyone, you're asking us what strategies we can employ to move toward greater collective economic. Yes. Yeah. Politics and yeah. Anyone can take it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I think that, I mean, there's so much that's been said, I'm kind of still digesting everything. But there are so many opportunities on the continent. Um, and one of the things is just to, to establish um, linkages and partnerships. I know we think that there's a lot of big ideas that have been told, you know, investing in a credit union or investing in this big bank and then everybody, you know, and then they invest and buy a gold mine or whatever in Zambia or wherever. But I think that um, my whole concept is building bridges. And so, you know, if you're a nurse out here, come to Kenya or go to Tanzania, meet the health community, meet a few nurses, partner together, offer your skills, see how you can do things. And I think that at, at the individual level, supporting each other and not charity, because charity has, has broken the back of many Africans, you know, right. this, this handout culture. We're not looking to receive handouts, we're looking for partnerships and friendships. And so um, there's a lot that's been said about, you know, African Americans bringing their wealth um, to Africa. But I think it's, it's deeper than that. It's about bringing yourself, bringing, you know, connecting on a heart level, on a soul level, and, and partnering to do different things, because there's a lot of things that can be done on the continent. So I would look at it sometimes instead of the big, the big, you know, investment plan, you just coming as you are, and coming and investing in, you know, partnering with a Kenyan or whatever. Like in Kenya, there's 500 African Americans who live and work there. Um, I just recently ran into them out of, I mean, ran into like their coordinator at a function, and they have various different projects going on. Um, a lot of them either moved, got married, or partnered with someone, built, you know, invested in a small farm or whatever. So I think that it's about creating those individual relationships, and that's what I'm really interested in, in terms of building bridges. And that can only be done by visiting the continent, getting your passport, visiting, you know, and, and coming, coming in conscious, like coming in, in awareness and consciousness, not just coming on a trip, but like, you know, because what you've been saying about intention, it's really true. Like, when if you go with the right intention in a place, the divine, the divinity will arrange everything where you'll meet the right people, you'll connect, you'll build f bonds, you'll build family. And there's so many people that I've met even from yesterday and today. So, because um, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know anyone in Africa, how will that work? But, you know, there's this, there's that, inner, there's that inner self, I won't get too into that, but there's that inner self, and if you set the intention out there and you come, you will connect, and you will be able to build those linkages and those bonds. So I would say we really need to look on an individual level, and there is something that we're trying to set up, like, because I've gotten a lot of emails from people saying, you know, I'm a plumber, could my skills be used, or, you know, I'm, I'm into various, so many different things. So we're trying to create those linkages and just hoping that people will find each other and bond. So, yes, find each other, bond, connect um, on the continent from here and, and figuring out how to be in conversation and connection with one another is the first step to being able to figure out how to function with greater economic stability. Um, I recently did an interview with Omoyele Showare, um, who is the Nigerian uh, presidential uh, aspirant. So he's running for president in Nigeria. Um, we had a dialogue and um, essentially we were speaking about the economic condition of Africa and Nigeria specifically as an outgrowth of the instability that colonialism caused. And so um, 
we, when we see images of Africa over here, and this is part of the divide, we haven't yet spoken too much about media representation, but of course media is a monster if not um, used strategically or understood strategically. Um, and so if you have people here in the States looking at images of Africa where you just see the mud hut and um, you see young Baba Tunde with the flies rolling around his face and a lot of poverty, right? And then you are like, oh, it seems like there's a lot of war and famine and poverty and a lot of things that I don't want nothing to do with over there. My goodness. But they, but I mean, this was a civilization that we came from that was once royal, that was dethroned by uh, uh, colonialism. So yes, that's true, but never showing the great wealth that exists. I mean, the great wealth not of just culture, financial wealth as well. And even though there is great debt as an outgrowth of colonialism, that there is so much beauty and wealth that you never see. And so, and then the media representation on the other side of the, uh, the Africans, the black people in Africa, seeing you know, women throwing drinks at each other and calling each other all kind of names and, um, and, uh, and black men on the media being perceived as criminal um, in terms of like, uh, this was noted in the, the documentary, The 13th, that Ava DuVernay did, where black people are shown on TV like 13 times more in as a criminal representative, representative than they actually engage in crime in this society and that that is a mechanism to make us dissociate ourselves from blackness. Because it's like, I'm not like those other black people. Me, myself, I am a proper black person, right? And what that does to us psychologically. But going back to my original point is, I was speaking about this with Omoyela Shawore. Y'all look him up, he is a revolutionary and he's trying to transform Nigeria. And he said something very powerful. He said that if Nigeria changes, then Africa will change because Africa so much follows the lead of Nigeria. And if Africa changes, then the condition of people across, of black people across the globe will change. It, because just like I said earlier in this conversation, if African or black people in America do not have some type of international body to call on and say, my human rights have been violated in, the, in this country and I am your people, right? We must take this to the UN. What are you gonna do? Not much of anything on a legal scale, Right? And so if we're talking practically, so in this conversation with him, I was, we were talking about the ways in which the leadership that exists now, a lot of the pl countries in Africa, is still like um, military leaders that, you know, that essentially are people that have been hand chosen, um, that will continue to facilitate a neo-colonial relationship with Europe and China. So they wonder, well, if Africa has all the oil, has all the mineral resources, why is it they haven't been able to build up the nation, the, uh, the continent so that black people across the diaspora can be in greater collaboration? Because the neo-colonial relationship is still stripping the resources from the land. So I had this conversation with him and the most, one of the most powerful things that he concluded with was that if we can transform the condition of African nations, um, and, and, and indeed, I don't want it to make it seem as though we then need to shift our attention to just internationally, but that if we do, if we work toward a greater economic stability here and work toward being able to be strategic around a, a global unification, a global economic kind of conversation, then we'll be able to put ourselves in a greater place. And so if you look into Omoyela Shoure, he's trying to transform Nigeria, which will transform Africa, which will transform the black diaspora. I will say, number one, one thing that we have to do is locate the common enemy. Because as Sister was saying just now, you see a black face, but it's not black authority that has the control over the resources. Because if that were the case, black authority backed by integrity for your people, then we would have been economically free in many of the countries. We would have been free culturally in many of the countries. We would be free and have access to everything that we need there. But as she was saying, due to uh, the International Monetary Fund, due to um, the Human Rights Council, which America, by the way, has rescinded or pulled itself out of, America is no longer part of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Um, some of you may understand what that means. Basically, America said we don't want to be hypocrites because we are violating human rights all the time. So we're going to pull ourselves out of the Human Rights Council, just so you know. So the America 
they blatantly admitted, yes, we violate human rights, so we just gonna bow out gracefully. Recently that occurred, so just to validate these points that they're bringing up. We have to look at the common enemy, which is, yes, the system of white supremacy, neo-colonialism, ignorance, etc. Then you have to confront those leaders as a collective, each one of the nations have to confront those leaders to see what their interest is and where their allegiance lies truly. Because as of right now, there are certain leaders who are railing against that system of white supremacy, neo-colonialism. They're saying, no, Africa for the Africans. These are my people. And one thing that the Nigerians do not have, which many other countries do have, is fear. America can't stand the Nigerians. Because Niger in America, with our African brothers on the continent, right now we can make this happen. Many of the leaders in Africa have extended free passports to some of us here. Do you know that? They've extended that. Ghana, I believe, is one of them. Uh, certain parts of Kenya and even certain leaders uh, in another one of the countries. They said, for those who would like to travel here, we will give you a free passport. They want us there. Julius Malema, some may agree with him, some may not. I love his feelings. Get about Donald Trump. I said, I roll that man. I love it. Because that's what we need to we as, as the men. I'm saying that it, in, it invigorates and inspires that fire that we need. So I'm like, brother, I like that. So he said, we need to let our brothers and sisters on in, in America know that we love them. As you just said. Everything that they're saying here is very, very powerful because they we need to know, do y'all hate us? Uh, right. You get you know, these are questions that this generation needs to know. Because all we we grew up here in African booty scratcher, and then we don't want to be a part of Africa. I'm just that's what they call it. They're like, what in the world? And so they would make fun of Africa, so we didn't want to be a part of that. But now it's like, no, we do, and they want us to be a part of their culture, and we want to come back. So we have to make the move. Yeah. Raise your hand if you have your passport. Wow. Awesome. Mm, very good. About 65 or 70 percent of the room. Beautiful. If you do not have your passport, get your passport now, not only because we might win the World War III tomorrow, but also <laughs> because you want to have the ability to make the move and to go and visit because it's not that hard and it's really not that expensive depending on where you go, but it's good for us to now as individuals as well as collective to go and understand the culture and really learn about one another because that's exactly what we need to do to establish free. Um, what do you love? What do you love to do? What's your passion? You know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes we, it seems like it's so big. Like, you know what I'm saying? We gotta make these major moves. We gotta do this real big organizational, institutional. What do you love to do? Africa is popping right now. African culture is popping right now. You are popping right now. The intention behind whatever it is that you want to do, and like the sister said, being heart-centered, you can do whatever you want to do. I'm talking, I'm talking individual, and then we're gonna go to the collective, right? What do you love? What is your passion? What is it that you, as a woman, as a man, as a writer, as a thinker, as an artist, as a dancer, as a hair stylist, as a designer, as a shoe designer, as an electrician, as an engineer, as a speaker, as a, 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 a children's clothes designer, as a doll maker, as a hair weave maker, whatever. You know what I'm saying? What do you love to do? <laughs> Let's start there. Mm -hmm. How many business owners we got in a room? <laughs> Everybody's not gonna start a business, right? Because then the business owners would not have employees, right? So I think sometimes we get in this situation where we like, everybody needs to start a business. No, everybody's not gonna be, everybody's not inspired to be a business owner, right? But the businesses in our communities need our support. I live in Atlanta now. 85% of the, the, venue, the vendors that I frequent are black. So for me, black economics is not some far down the road thing that I have to make it. I continuously, 
give money to my people, right? Um, who's your realtor? Who's your dentist? Mm -hmm. Who's your doctor? Mm -hmm. Who cuts your grass? Who, you know what I'm saying? The basic, fundamental, everyday things that all of us do. Who, do you support them? Do you, do you promote them on your social media page? We, we live in a time right now like there is no boundaries. I, I know we're talking about globalism and international. To me, everything's international now. I talk to people, I communicate with people, I purchase from people, people purchase from me all around the world. So to me, there are no boundaries at this point from an economic <laughs> perspective. Um, Claude, Dr. Claude Anderson, in his book, Black Labor, White Wealth, he talked about we need to become business owners in specific industries that we frequent. So sports, right? Everybody don't have to be a ball player. There are so many different businesses that fall under the sporting category. Music, everybody don't have to be a rapper. We need engineers, we need people that do uh, uh, you know, podcasts and get all, know about SoundCloud and all of these new mediums and apps and all of this stuff. Where, what, where, where are you at on that? What's your specific interest? What's that thing that drives you? Because you know, some people come to, we come to college, right? Some people come to college to find themselves, right? And some people leave lost. <laughs> this is facts, right? And in debt. Um, I think that, you know, we've got to start approaching money and approaching economics from a different, from an abundant mindset. Because when we talk about money, it's always, black, we, we spend $1.3 trillion a year and we don't have this and we don't have that. Rightfully so, right? But we gotta give ourselves a little bit more credit. You know what I'm saying? I see all these natural hairstyles in this room right now. I ain't no white woman doing your hair. I know you spend money with your people. Camille Rose, um, uh, so many of the, I'm thinking of the, 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 the names of the hair companies that do that, the hair products that we buy. I got a whole, you know what I'm saying? Probably a thousand dollars worth of stuff in my house, right? But I, I spent all the money with my people. And if, if there's not a black beauty supply, then just go to the Chinese beauty supply and block, buy the black products. You know what I'm saying? So I think that, you know, it's not that difficult what we have to do. The mountain is not that steep. Right. We're already going in the right direction. Uh, Professor James Small said, economics is when you take your culture and you sell it back to your people. So take your culture and sell it back to your people. And I'm not just talking about dashikis and, you know what I'm saying, tennis shoes with Africa and red, black, and green and Africa earrings and all of that is important, right? But what is culture, art, literature, if you are a writer, you know what I'm saying? All of the different facets, urban uh, uh, farming, agriculture. I mean, who, who's going to school to learn how to be a veterinarian? Where's our connection to our planet? There's a big push in, in, in loving nature and well-being and enlightenment and spirituality right now, right? We gotta get back in touch and in tune with our planet. Talk about money. There is, there's endless resources for us out here. There is no ceiling for us at this point. The pendulum always swings back to stone. It's a law of the universe. It swung in this direction. We got put on ships. We came over here. We got lynched. We got all of these wrong things that have happened to us. The pendulum is sw swinging in the other direction. So the universe is in your corner right now. Take the step. Ruby said, Ruby said, Take the step towards your, your, your uh, passion and the doors will open for you, like the sister said. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to have all the money. You don't have to have all the resources. Stop worrying, stressing about your credit not being an 800. Stop stressing about the fact that you can't get $50,000 to start or 5,000 or whatever. Take the step in the right direction. Create a vision board. What type of business are you interested in? 
You going to school as an engineer or you going for software technology or whatever you're, don't wait until you graduate college and then start trying to figure it out. Take the step in the right direction and it'll start to unfold. That's, if, at, individually, if everybody in here started a business or contributed to a black owned business, that's cooperative economics. Right. I have a group, myself and a hundred other women across the country it's like a susu. Every month, everybody puts $20 in and we give it to a member in the group. We don't tell you what to do with your money. We don't tell you, you know what I'm saying? Well, you gotta invest it back in the community. No, you are the community. Invest it in yourself. Every month, everybody in here can start a group like that. We got friends that are trying to start businesses that we're not supporting, but we online defending celebrities that we don't know. It doesn't make sense. The, for me, the stigma about economics in our community has to change. We have to start thinking from a mindset of abundance. Not what you don't have, what you do. Our culture is everything. Everybody in the world is watching us right now. Hell yeah, Wakanda forever. How do you create a business from that? You know what I'm saying? So. I'm not going to even pretend to have a really deep uh, <laughs> about how to do this. I am not. I, I didn't go to school for money. Um, what I will say is this, and this is just from my own lived experience. We are a very resilient people. And I oftentimes feel like we forget that. And I, I, I've been holding on to that word resilient because a lot of you in this room may know my story and a lot of you may not. Last year I started a new job Thursday. I was fired that Friday. And it was because I had openly spoken about the institution and the issue that they had had about white, with white supremacy and all these other race issues. Um, the institution didn't like that and said, you can go ahead and get your coach bag and walk. I said, thanks, all right. Um, but there was something that was important for me in that because um, in the week that I spent worrying about where my bills were gonna get paid, I had to say, you know what? You are smart and you have lived and you have seen your family make it, you have seen your family's family make it. This is not the end for you. And I will tell you this, and I'm, I'm not trying to brag, but I made more money last year doing what I do now by just believing in what I know than what I've ever made in my career, in the 15 years that I've been working in my career. Now, not everybody can do that, but what I'm saying is, is what I've learned in this, and I'm, I'm gonna say this because it's important to, to know, that I think many of us, and we're talking about economics, we look at people as the competition. And I think that that's the thing that worked for me and mine was when I got on social media, when I started connecting with people, I was straight up and saying, I don't, I'm not trying to take your spot. And, I, and, and I, I don't want you coming for me either. Let's figure out how we gonna make this work together. And unity is so important. And so now I do a lot of stuff in entertainment. I've gotten gigs, and most of the gigs that I have gotten have come from black women, have come from other black writers, have come from other, I work for Blavity now. Um, that's kind of where a lot of my bread and butter comes from. But knowing that Lily took that chance to hire me once all of that happened, right? I, I was able to be able to see that there was this thing of, I don't want your spot. What can we do to open the door for each other? There are a lot of, I'm in, I'm in conversation with a couple of writers right now for different shows and stuff that we wanna do. I am constantly going to them and saying, what can I learn from you and what can you learn from me and how can we work together to get that bag? <laughs> and I think that that's the thing that we have to be cognitive of. Yes, you can start your own business, but sometimes you don't have to. You just have to have that one connection with somebody who can open a door for you. And I think that that's the one thing we miss is that we're so caught up in fighting because of the way that the world has, has created the system around us that we stop, we don't stop and go, wait a second, you're not the enemy. That's right. You're really not the enemy. The system is the enemy. So how can we work together to overcome it? And so I am a true testament to that, right? I go home tomorrow and when I, when I wake up, I'm like, oh, there's five checks in the mail. But out of those five checks that are coming in the mail, those were five black or brown people who opened the door for me to get that check because they didn't see me as competition and I didn't see them as competition. We are working together to make sure that we can live. So I'm telling everybody, tap into your resilience, do what the sister said here. Um, my therapist said something, get you a therapist too, because that didn't happen until I got one. Um, <laughs> if, you got, if you got a job and you got some money in your pocket, get a therapist. But my therapist said something, two things to me in the last few months, and, I, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. But the one thing that is so powerful for me to share, because when I was in my darkest moment, when I'm talking dark, I'm talking Kanye West dark. Um, <laughs> child, um, when I say, when I say 
when I, when I say this, my therapist, who is a black queer woman, said these two things to me and it changed my world. She said, first, who are you fighting? Who are you fighting? You always come in here with your boxing gloves on. Take them off. She was like, when are you gonna run the ring and start realizing that you have the opportunity to own all of the fights that are happening within, right? So when do you become that person? And then the last thing she said to me last week, she says, when are you gonna stop fearing the yes in yourself? And that opened up a lot of things. So now I just email people. I don't even care if I know the person. I got this and I want to get this, can you help me? And I will tell you right now, I'm not, I'm not even trying to name drop, but like knowing that Stephen Canales, I have, I have dinner with him next week. He is the, the executive producer of Pose, one of the greatest shows on FX with the highest ratings at this point. We have dinner next week. Simply because I reached out to him and just said, hey, I just, I'm just trying to get to where you got it, where you're going. And he was like, let's have dinner, let's talk. So I'm telling you all, please stop fearing the yes in yourself, tap into your resilience, and I guarantee you will find a little bit of change to buy what you want to buy. to that, uh, fear and the yes in yourself. I um, am grateful that I was raised by two parents that really influenced the, for me to say yes to myself. Um, I'm, I'm healthy and um, that is not some type of braggadocious anything. I think that like we can be able to be like proud of ourselves. Like I'm healthy, I'm a healthy human, right? Because I had a mother and a father that worked together to make me whole, right? Um, they were always a perfect example of a healthy marriage, but they were always a perfect example of their love for me as a father and mother. That's a side note. But when I, when I talk about health, I went to the Usha village two years ago. I wanna make two points. I went to see Dr. CB. We know who Dr. CB is? Dr. CB is one of the greatest uh, natural healers, holistic practitioners, uh, herbalist to have ever lived. He passed away two summers ago. I went there to meet him um, so that we could sit down and have a conversation about natural healing and the way in which black people have always had the answer about how to heal our minds and bodies uh, through using what the world offers us. So if you don't know who Dr. Sebi is, just do a quick Google search. So I'm at the Usha village, I'm there, and I'm, um, I wasn't sick, but I wanted to do a cleanse and talk to Sebi and be at the Usha village. That's the village that he brings the patients to, to do their natural healing. So he's been able to, um, when, uh, before he passed and transitioned, Sebi was able to prove that he could cure cancer, that he could cure uh, diabetes, that he could cure all of the diseases that Western medicine has told us are incurable, right? Um, and so what I observed when I was there was um, that his uh, family, some of his family worked there. It was all black Honduran staff, because it's in Honduras, right? Um, and just the whole uh, equation, a very systemic, complex equation to make sure that all of the alkaline foods and all of the herbs and all the things were prepared every day for people who had stage four cancer right, that is a complex equation to make sure that everybody has what they need, all being ran by black nurses, black chefs in Honduras. So I observed that and it's interesting because point number two, right before I went to Honduras to observe that on my 26th birthday, I'm 28 now, so this is when I was 26, I, I was here in the States, here in LA, doing the work of organizing that I do and teaching and whatnot. I went to a meeting that I had scheduled with Terry, who is the chief executive officer, and also in the meeting was the chief operating officer of One United Bank, which is the largest black bank in the nation, if you all don't know. So I go to my meeting with them to talk to them about how to further amplify the bank black movement to make sure that it can be productive and useful and not just kind of like, you know, um, not trendy, and, but, but something that can be a bit more substantial. How can we really do this to make it effective? Because we talk about building black, banking black, buying black all the time, but like, but how can we really make it functional? So I went to have that conversation with them. We crafted a plan. 
Um, we crafted a plan and then we started to circulate information to encourage everybody to, to disinvest from Wells Fargo and Chase and all of these other banks that were funding the prison industrial complex, that were funding an oil pipeline that is um, something that could be considered egregious and violent toward not only the Native American people of this land, the indigenous people, but us as well. And so these banks that are funding all of these horrendous projects that are not helpful to us, how do we disinvest from those and then put our money into black banks and then encourage people to do that? We did this plan. And what did what happened? We disseminated the information and wrote two articles, and I wrote my little spiel on the article saying why people should take their money and put it in one United Bank. Interestingly enough, there was about three different responses. One of the first responses that I got from black people, and this is why I say we have to be able to think collectively. collectively. One of the first responses that I got from a lot of black people was, oh, well, why are we gonna take all our money from that bank and put it in the black bank? They, um, they gonna do the same thing as the white bank. What they gonna do for us? Nothing, they ain't, they're not taking the money and redistributing it into the community. This, the white banks aren't doing that, and neither are the black banks. We just making some one or two black people more rich, okay, and so what? Right. But they weren't thinking in terms of the fact that, let's say that that was true, that they're not doing necessarily anything for the community. At least you're not funding your own oppression. Right. Mm -hmm. right. In Wells Fargo and Chase, even just that is enough to be like, all right, right. let's reinvest right. here. Right. Even just that. Second response, I done wrote it down because I'd be forgetting. Um, Second response, that's, um, that's capitalistic engagement. You know, it doesn't matter where you bank, capitalism is treacherous, capitalism is what the problem is, what the problem is, cap white cap capitalist, patriarchal white supremacy, that that is the problem and it doesn't matter where you bank, it's just capitalism is capitalism is capitalism. But the thing is they were understanding that this black bank was willing to do financial training seminars for black people, was willing to have seminars about how to reinvest in the Crenshaw district so that it's not so uh, desperately uh, gentrified. Right? When we talk about gentrification, it's like, oh, they bring in, they, they kicking us out the hood. That can't happen if you own the houses in the hood. Oh that can't happen if you know what to do with the community's money. You don't know what to do, but this black bank is willing to do that. This black bank has been saying, hey, come on over to the financial training seminar, to the uh, financial literacy seminar. But you've dismissed it because it's just a bank, just like the other white banks, right? And then lastly, um, oh, that the people that were willing to do that, and like, okay, we'll reinvest, we'll bank black, that that's the end of their racial consciousness. Like, that's all they gonna do. Now they gonna bank black, and they ain't gonna have no other conversations about any other type of building with black people, right? And so you can't just then, okay, now I'm gonna move from Wells Fargo over to the black bank, and you've done your part. Now you're an activist. You've done it, right? You've done your activist deed. That's where it ends. We have to realize there's a lot of different things that go into this project. And we have to be able to see the bigger picture, right? And even if it's in the meantime, if banking black is a means for the meantime for black people to begin to do some type of economic collectivity to work toward a greater good in the future, that's okay. Sometimes it is baby steps. It's not always like revolution or nothing. Sometimes it's small everyday revolutions. And we have to be able to contend with that or else we won't be able to take those baby steps to get to the big step. Thank you all for such great responses. I think like this was a really, me and Isaiah were talking on the side, like this was a really good conversation. It was very much needed. Um, we have a lot of questions and we can't answer all of them. So we want to encourage uh, you all, if we don't answer the, or quite ask the few that we do ask, to uh, take the time and connect with the speakers um, in the lobby area afterwards. Um, so we're just gonna ask a few questions and we just ask maybe one person answer it and then, cause we're gonna, you know, we wanna make sure we can honor the schedule and everything. Um, so for the, this question, um, I think it's really um, relevant because a lot of times the, the responses and everything that you were giving, they're so powerful and they're so impactful. Um, but it's easy to, to fall back into the everyday structure and the routine of how the, success, the society functions. So this question asks, how are we as black individuals supposed to build community and rise 
when we are still weighed down by our ontological position in the society. So if one person could just touch it, one or two people could touch on it. <laughs> Looking at me. Ontological position? Like, I, I want to make sure that everybody, because we're we not over here pontificating, but we all got to hear each other. We having a con we're not even lecturing at y'all. This is a conversation. Right. Hello? Right? Yes. Hello? Yes. Right. Okay. We're going to have to wake up now. Right. Now we're going to have to wake up. Ontological, what we mean is just like the theory of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So if, if y'all asking us about how we can engage in like, what, like how do we unify even though there's different theories of knowledge and ideologies that each of us from our different groups has. Brothers from the nation, I'm not from the nation, but I, I mess with the nation in terms of, I, I rocks with so much of what the nation stands for, right? So we're different um, in terms of make different, uh, what you would say, um, sometimes a bit of the ideological framework, but it doesn't stop the unification. But I'm not even trying to answer the question, I was just trying to give some context. <laughs> Get answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll say this. Find the commonality between each and every one of the groups that you follow or look up to because there are too many things that we can agree on. And we are all in some way, shape, or form going towards the overall goal of our true freedom, justice, and equality. A lot of work is being done, a lot of movement, and then there's a lot of motion happening as well but we are absolutely making this thing happen. So if you were saying weighed down, whoever asked the question, you are weighed down because you want to be, to a degree. We are in the information age. Right now, if you are not researching, if you're not on YouTube looking up the scholars, if you're not watching, I don't know, what different documentaries from the 13th to Hidden Colors, et cetera, it's because you choose not to. It's because you choose to watch Cardi B and Jan all day long. It's, it's up to you now, right? It's all up to you now. So at a certain point, you can't blame anybody because you actually have that access to the information. True. We don't get lynched for reading now. Yeah. It's legal now. Yeah. So I'm yeah. taking yeah. full advantage. Yeah. All that I can get, because I can get killed for it. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to all have the same mentality. So reach for it is what I'm saying, and you will find it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> 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 final qu final uh, question. So, <clears throat> how important is the spirit or spirituality in the process of rising above oppression? Oh, please let me answer this. <laughs> one, one, to two, one to two people, maybe. It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's everything. Yeah. You know, I, I hear this, this, and I've been hearing this for so long, my whole entire life. Why can't we get ahead? Black people in America or around the world, we have access to so much. We have our phones now, we have unlimited information. We've had all of these great teachers from Noble Drew Ali to Elijah Muhammad to Marcus Garvey to, you know what I'm saying? All of these great scholars and thought leaders. Why can't we get ahead? We are not honing in on the conversation and the reality of spirituality. Right. I'm not talking about religion. Religion is a tool to get you there. Right. Everybody won't use that tool. Right. Some of us will go back to Africa and use African concepts of spirituality. Some of us will go through Buddhism. Some of us will go through Eastern thought. Um, there is a, a concept in Eastern thought called the, 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 when I say Eastern thought, I'm talking about Hinduism, I'm talking about Buddhism, I'm talking about all of those, those branches of thought, right? That talks about the dark night of the soul. Collectively, as if there's a collective and then there's an individual, right? How many people in here have had a dark night of the soul? I'm talking about that low, 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 low point. Where when you looking in the mirror, you know what I'm saying? That, that you talk about the enemy. When you looking in the mirror and you hate what you see. Not because white people show white women on Vogue and it makes you feel some kind of way about your facial features. I'm talking about your internal strife. The flaws and 
those, those characteristics and personality traits and things that have happened to you because of your parents and your family and all of the things that have created this combination of who you are, the dark night of the soul, right? We need a blueprint as a people. And one of my goals over the next two years is to write a book called The Science of Self where I take Islam, Sufism, African spirituality, Buddhism, Hinduism, the, the, the gospel, according to black people in America, because you know we, you know what I'm saying, we are some big, we, religious, spiritual, whatever you want to call it, is there's no way we could have made it through what we've been through without tapping into a higher source, right? So taking all of those concepts and bringing them together and trying to create a blueprint that's not difficult, it's not hard to be a good person. It's not hard to be kind to other people. It's not hard, you got. we have to be love. I wrote a post on Instagram, and I was going back to the point I was making about 99% of our reality is the unseen, 1% is the, the, the physical reality. Anything to do what she does, and she serves the women in our group continuously and has been doing it for almost three years now, straight out of love. So love can be measured, the wavelength of love can be actually measured, the wavelength of hate and fear can actually be measured. So when we talk about spirituality, I look at it, I have a scientific mind. I got to be, it's got to make sense to me. You can't just tell me something. So when we talk about the science of spirituality, there is a measurable reality to having compassion and being kind and having love around you. This is why we're so hard as a people because the world has not loved us. We're the bastard child, so to speak, of the world, right? So you can grow up in a love. So when we talk about spirituality, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, I think it is extremely important, whatever you study, whatever your concept of religion or going into all of these different mediums, the number one agenda and rule has to be your own personal well-being. Well-being, spiritual, physical, mental, emotional. What do you do emotionally in order to elevate yourself? If you know that you have abandonment issues or your father left you when you were young or your mother didn't give you enough nurturing and breastfeed you or you know what I'm saying, you grew up in the hood and the brothers was picking on you and beating you up or you was a young light-skinned woman and the sisters was beating you up or you know all these little issues we, you know what I'm saying? Dark skin, thick hair, everybody was talking about you. What are you doing every single day to contribute to your emotional well-being? Listening to meditation music, listening to African drums, listening to Tibetan bowls, yoga. I'm a yogi, I had to say that, right? Um, spiritually, studying these different mindsets, going out in nature, I, man, and especially being here in California, I'm me being in Atlanta, I can't tell you how many times I've been in turmoil or seeking clarity or seeking guidance. And see, I didn't come from a two-parent household. I come from, I came from a, 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 a environment where I didn't have proper guidance. So I had to turn, I had to turn to spirituality. I had to believe in something greater. I had to believe that I was connected to something bigger because there's no way I could be this marvelous, wonderful human being, you know what I'm saying? And still be neglected at the same time. And that goes for all of us. So nature, um, traveling, we have to get out and see the world. There's so much in this world, so many cultures, so, so many different experiences, so many different types of people. This planet is 196 million and 900 and 40,000 square miles, right? Yes, sir. You see what I'm saying? How could we only be in Long Beach? How could we only be in LA? How could we only be in Oakland? How could we only be in Atlanta? How could we only be in Texas? How could we only be in Chicago? This is, you know what I mean? We are global people. We are the rulers of this planet. We are here to take care of it. We're here to be one with nature. We are nature. Right. You are nature. It's not mother nature out there. It's mother nature in here. Physically. You can't talk about revolution if you can't get up a flight of stairs. Oh, no. <laughs> Martial arts. 
yoga, fitness, you know what I'm saying? Going to the gym, working out. You have to exercise all of these different parts of yourself, mentally, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. That's spirituality. It's not gonna look the same for me as it looks for you, but I support and, 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 and implore you and encourage you to seek some concept of something higher because if you study the human anatomy, if you study the human brain, you'll, see the, you'll find the same elements, the same minerals, the same intentions, the same energy, the same frequencies, the vibra same vibrations, that's in the sun. That's, right. that's in the moon. That's in the solar system. So you are a universe unto yourself. Tap in. That's All right. right. One Less than that. Okay. Okay. You already know. <laughs> number one, for each and every individual in here, just know that you are a God. Number one. God, before you disagree and say, okay, Jesus, Muhammad, hold on one second. God means one who is possessed with force and power. One who has force and power, control, or the ability to have dominion over something. If you are able to conquer your barriers in life, you are a God. But if your barriers conquer you, then they are your God. So that, I had to just uptail that and also a part of being nature if you look at your hands it looks just like a leaf in nature and with the vitamin d coming from the sun us being melanated and or sun people we are made molecularly of the chemicals or the compound molecular structure of stardust which is carbon 12 to be exact so we are quite literally the sun people so getting back into nature activates your spiritual propensity as a being which will in turn enforce or reinforce that God nature within yourself. So I just want that. Well, seconds. I just want to say, <laughs> anxiety and depression is on the loose. Anxiety and depression is so fiercely present, and I observe it all the time and I navigate so carefully who I share my energy with because we um, consume the people's energy that surrounds us. M mind and guard your energy and your body in this time and space when anxiety and depression is on the loose. And if you suffer from anxiety and depression, do not shame yourself for that, but then seek to do the inner work to challenge that condition. It's possible, last thing I will say is that I'm grateful that I learned about who I am before I learned about political systems. I learn about intention, about what to eat, about the, about the way that I could dress, about the way that I could move with grace and confidence and fierceness in the world before I learned about white supremacy and all kind of other systems. So I was never a victim to all of those things that were telling me that I was not fully human and valuable. I knew who I was before the world tried to tell me what they think I am. So I was stable. So do that, it's inside. Healthy human. <laughs> I do have to move forward. I'm sorry. Yeah, talk to me. Okay, I know you want to say. No, I just wanted to say that you have to be aware there's an awakening happening among our people. And it's happening all over the world. It's unstoppable. Like they, you know, the powers that be, whatever you want to call them, they don't know what's happening. We ourselves don't know what's happening. Secondly, Africa is 60% under 25. So as the age that we are, we are the teachers of tomorrow for these young people. So there's an awakening happening and you just have to decide what side of the awakening you're on. Because as much as there's an awakening, there's also anxiety, there's also depression, there's also the darkness coming for you. But if you switch to the awakening, it will happen naturally because it's the God inside of you that's awakening. That's what I'm talking about. It's one statement that I want to leave with y'all. Be careful because not everybody's invested in your healing. Thank you again to all of our panelists. Can we give them one more round of applause?